Hey, good looking. It's your boy, Jack Slack. Fire's Gone By podcast episode 146. Coming back from holiday, jumping straight on to the moving treadmill that is uh, MMA news and happenings. Um, some Lots of people, in fact, messaged me saying this was the worst possible week for me to go away because Gegard Musassi just got uh, handled by fringe middleweight contender Rafael Lovato Jr. Also, there was some fuckery in one, which, you know, I don't know if we touched on that before I left, but there was nonetheless. Um, and there was tons of fights. There were two Bellator events, one UFC event, one bare knuckle boxing event, which was the bare knuckle boxing event, which we've seemingly been talking about for months and months and months. Um, so yeah, lots to cover. Uh, I've been catching myself up on it, so I'll really just talk about the stuff that stood out to me because you don't want to hear me talk about Bellator, uh, Rory versus Naaman prelim fights from like two weeks ago. Uh, I'd also be lying because I don't watch the Bellator prelims because they're normally garbage. But yes, thank you for asking. I did have a good holiday. Uh, I spent lots of time by the pool, enjoyed a lot of French food, which just shits on almost all other food in the world. Chowed down on uh, truffles at like half the standard price that you'd get them in the UK. Drank shit tons of wine. Uh, did a load of wine tastings. Have no idea about wine, but now I pretend to. Any way that sort of like legitimizes day drinking, I'm up for. Said that I'd do some length in the pool just to keep the cardio up, but just sort of floated there instead. Read a load of books. Uh, Mask of Demetrius, a famous old detective story. Mm, not great. Um, read a fascinating book called The Age of Scandal, which was about the uh, late 18th century in England and uh, sort of the aristocracy of the time, the writers and the politicians and the royals. Gave me some ideas for history stuff that I might want to do at some future point just for the Patreon boys. Oh, and then on the way home, I, I got Cuphead on the Switch because I hate flying and uh, I wanted to play Cuphead for a long time. Don't really use my, my computer for gaming. Um, it's all full of just fight footage and studies and shit. So yeah, broke out the Switch, got the Cuphead, and uh, that is beastly hard, that game. But I'm a huge uh, fan of like uh, animation from you know the golden age of, of Warner Brothers, Tex Avery, things like that, the old MGM cartoons. So really nice to see like uh, a product that's made with uh, such love and care by the dudes. I think that they were saying that it's like a team of less than 10 people did most of the animation and stuff, which is insane because like the amount of frames of animation that are going on on the screen at any time, um, really impressive. Anyway, let's get into fight talk. News before we do anything else. Uh, I suppose the big pieces are things like Sean O'Malley just got pulled from his upcoming bout. Uh, was that with Chito Vera? But that, this is, again, due to the Osterine, which was what took him out of his... Uh, well, what got him suspended for a, a good length of time last time. This is an interesting one because it sort of harkens back to the, the idea of the pulsing. You know, they, they say... Well, in O'Malley's statement, because obviously you don't have to actually reveal that you've uh, been caught by your son now. Like, you just would have a very long layoff and people would start to get suspicious. But O'Malley was quite upfront about it and got out ahead of it and said, I'm off because of USADA. They said they found uh, more. He didn't use the word picogram, so I didn't feel like it was very scientific. But uh, he said that they found trace amounts of Austrian in his system, which does sound a little like what's happening with John Jones. So maybe we see him get a, that sort of asterisk next to his test findings from now on. At any rate, it doesn't seem like they're going to punish him. They're more just to take him off the card to work out what's going on like they famously didn't do with John Jones <laughs> and moved the whole event uh, over the, the other side of the state to uh, accommodate him. There was, you know, there were some interesting dropouts ahead of the uh, UFC card that happened this weekend. Uh, John Lineker pulled out, which was a pain in the ass because that was the fight I was really looking forward to. John Lineker versus Rob Font. Lineker, if you'll remember, he was complaining that like he wasn't booked often enough and he was getting on Sean Shelby and whoever the other guy are to book him more often. Uh, and then you, now you look at his... Um, Tapology page, and he's pulled out four times in his last six bookings, which is pretty astounding. Um, don't believe it was revealed what the cause was. I saw some people saying like a cut, uh, as in uh, an actual cut on his face. Um, but you'd think you'd hear something official from the UFC or a commission regarding that. Um, so it sounds more like pulling out due to weight cut issues, which wouldn't be, you know, no stranger for John Lineker. And of course, um, Bruno Silva also pulled out of his fight on that. Uh, or was pulled out <laughs> of his uh, fight with Darren Wynn on that card, uh, and that later turned out to be due to a USADA um, test violation. And that meant that Darren Wynn ended up fighting uh, Eric Spicely. Uh, and we'll talk about that fight in a bit. What else is going on? Other bookings. Uh, Serkinov versus Krut. 
Uh, and Todd Duffy is coming back for Vancouver. Both those fights on Vancouver. Don't think they said uh, who's fighting Todd Duffy yet, but he hasn't fought since like uh, 2014, 2015. Was his last one that god awful performance against Frank Mir? When you're making Mir look like a slick boxer, you know, you've got some problems. It's so weird because his fight against. Um, who was that? The guy with the hammer fist of doom. No, it's not going to come to me. But that fight, he was doing like shifting combination work, looking really sharp, and people were like, this guy's boxing. He's the future of heavyweight. And then he fights, uh, gets into a contract dispute, fights Alistair Overeem, um, just sort of swings wild and gets murdered, uh, and then just never looked the same since. Swinging punches from like behind him with his arms straight. But Zirkunov versus Crute is good. If you saw Crute against um, Paul Craig, he looked really le legit. Used the uh, Kimura both as a sweep and as a pass. And looked good on the feet, but then he was fighting Paul Craig, so you know. <laughs> Bellator have just booked uh, Mitrione versus Haritanov 2 for Bellator uh, for August. Um, not really 2 because the first fight didn't go any distance. It was just a kick in the dick from Matt Mitrione, who's a brutally hard leg kicker. You know, he, I would probably rate him as one of the hardest low kickers in the sport because he's a heavyweight who kicks well. Um, and Haritanov just took the brunt of it straight into his cup. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. And then he turned up the next night on the following Bellator in the crowd, smiling and waving through the fence. <laughs> I was like, I assume he's sitting on like a hemorrhoid donut. But he seems to be okay, because he's coming back, so that's good. Other booking news, uh, Whitaker versus Adesanya is official for UFC 243. I mean, we all assumed it was, but now they've actually announced it. Jason Knight versus Leonard Garcia is uh, going on at BKB soon. Jesus Christ. I mean, well, that is... Leonard Garcia is the perfect fighter for the BKB crowd, especially if you saw the decision in the Lobov Malalaji fight, which we'll get onto in a minute. And then Kleber Koika Erbst uh, announced that he's now uh, done with his KS KSW contract uh, and is uh, considering offers from other promotions. That's interesting because I was, if you recall, I did a couple of um, prospect watch pieces back in the day, well, not back in the day, uh, last year. Uh, I might get back into them because I like, you know, it's just another thing that I can give the Patreon boys. But um, Kleber was one of the guys that I had lined up ready to do. Uh, he's very highly uh, ranked in the world, according to, like, you know, Fight Matrix, Tapology, Ranking, MMA, all those sites. And he's very, very good. I mean, he's very flawed. He's uh, a fantastic grappler, doesn't have the best takedowns, and his striking is just kicks. Kind of like Paul Craig, to be honest. Um, but he's so slick when he gets to the ground, uh, both on top and on bottom. Submitted guys like uh, Miguel Torres, and actually won the KSW featherweight title at one point. But that title has bounced all over the place uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, one I'm just mentioning it because he's one you should keep your eye on. And if he gets invited to the UFC, you know, don't expect him to tear up through the rankings unstopped. I, I expect that he will have some serious trouble when he meets guys who can strike and stop a takedown. Um, but a bit of an oddity in MMA. A really slick guard player too. And so straight out of the miscellaneous pile, Cejudo's had, his sh uh, had a surgery on a shoulder that's been troubling him for a while. So he's out for five months, which basically means the flyweight division's dead. Um, and oh, and Petty Yan is begging to have an interim title fight with, with Aljamain Sterling. And you're just like, why? If, if the dude's only out five months, why do you want an a interim title fight? Uh, calm the fuck down. Who are these people who are like excited to... Well, I suppose it's because it guarantees you the next title shot. You know, it's very hard to deny... Well, they're trying to do it to Colby Covington, but it's very hard to deny the guy with the interim title the next title shot. So maybe that's why. But I, who are these people who are excited to win an interim title like like it's a world title? And then other news, Patrick Smith died. Um, Patrick Smith, UFC 1 veteran. If you remember, he came out with the <laughs> kick the barn door down teep against, uh, was it Ken Shamrock? And then got heel hooked very quickly. Uh, Fort Hoist very early on too. Um and, you know, he's remembered for that, but uh, also knocked out uh, Andy Hug in kickboxing very early into Andy Hug's kickboxing career. Because they were very... K1 was very hot on Andy Hug from early on because he'd been such a um, superstar in Kyokushin competition and Sado stuff, uh, which, you know, not a huge number of people are watching, but the uh, Kyokushin roots of the K1 organization and uh, and so on uh, meant that they were quite hot on him. So they had this whole event called Andy's Glove, where Andy Hug tried kickboxing for the first time. But yeah, uh, Patrick Smith, if you watch that first fight, it's absolutely nuts. Patrick Smith comes out like axe kicking with Andy Hug, and Andy Hug's sort of like thrown off by this guy axe kicking back at him. Um, but then in the rematch, uh, Hug just does him. 
uh, shows him the axe kick, kicks him in the ribs with just... That was the great thing about Andy Hook. By showing people the axe kick, you've got their hands way up in the air above them. Because there's not really a way to, to block above your head from just a normal guard, which is one of the wonderful things about the axe kick. So he shows him the axe kick, kicks him in the ribs, uh, and just sends him to the mat. Smoked him in the second fight, but that was sort of Andy Hook's thing. He would get blown out by dudes and then come back better against the same dudes. But yeah, just interesting that Patrick Smith died. Didn't see what it was of, um, but the article about him <laughs> very quickly brought up his uh, sexual assault conviction for, um, I think it was a 14-year-old girl or something like that. Oh, yeah, well, let's not get into that. That's depressing. Um, recaps. So, there was a good amount on. Um, let's talk about Rory versus uh, Naaman first, because that's where we hopped off last week. Um, turned out pretty good. I thought Rory looked all right. Uh, landing the counter right hand on the feet, which is what he was landing against... Uh, Fitch. Naaman was getting to clinches and Rory was trying to shuck himself free and Naaman would do like that Mike Tyson thing where you're just pinching their glove in your armpit so you're really far out it's not like an overhook at all but you do have them trapped um, and Rory would hit him with an upward elbow with the right arm uh, and he did that a few times which was really nice. Naaman hit a really nice takedown either first or second went straight into a sag throw or an outside trip whatever you one or the other it looked like both but uh, landed on top and Rory put his toes in the fence and dragged himself up into a into a uh, like a leg uh, entanglement, and the referee just didn't give a shit. His toes were in the fence for like three seconds, visibly above him before he did anything, and then he heaved himself up. Um, some re- some of the refing in Bellator was pretty bad, which is weird because it was the same refs who were refing in the UFC. So I have no idea what makes them bad in Bellator, but. Heaves himself into this leg reap, and then Naaman dives on his other leg uh, and starts a leg lock battle, which was pretty cool because Naaman, well, the, uh, you know, for us, Sahabi and his guys have been working on the leg stuff for a long time with, you know, because they've got that Danaher, um, well, Henzo Gracie lineage, and Danaher's obviously one of uh, Henzo's top instructors, so for us, we'll have trained with him uh, a good deal, but they also send up the Death Squad guys to train at TriStar. So, you know, occasionally you see like Rory McDonald, uh, going for an Iminari role or something like that, and people go, oh, it doesn't work, because it didn't work too well against Thompson, didn't uh, work out well at all against Musassi, but uh, he, he tends to go to it when he's like out of ideas or a little bit worried. But you did get to see his understanding of the leg-locking game working well here against Neyman, because Neyman is actually really good on the legs. Um, and there's, there's sort of a thing where like people don't expect guys from a Gracie, well, with the Gracie name, to be great with the leg locks, because it's kind of like they're seen as like the traditionalists, but Naaman is, is very much of like the modern generation of grappler. There was another one where Rory got top position and Naaman did, went to th- underhook the leg and went to throw his legs up for like a, a, a shoulder clamp or I can't remember what um, Danaher calls it. Some people call it a corner lock, but where you throw your legs up and lock over the shoulder so that you are ready to move into the armbar. Uh, but then pendulums Rory straight into uh, almost a sweep and then rolls back over his shoulder and attacks a belly down armbar. Uh, but Rory stepped over and, and stopped that. It's always good when you get to see Rory grappling extensively on the ground in like in more flowy jiu exchanges, as opposed to John Fitch, hold him against the fence and don't let him move, whatever, you know, <laughs> however bad or good the position is for you, just don't let it advance. Last round ended with um, Naaman in mount and Rory really struggling. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I can see Rory winning it, but I... Watching it, I wasn't super convinced. I was like, hey, you know, <laughs> if we were judging the fight overall, I might even give it to Naaman. Obviously, round by round scoring. I was watching this in Russian because I had to catch up. Uh, and even then, John McCarthy's moronic uh, take on things snuck in where they came in the last round. He's given like every round to Rory on the um, scorecards. It popped up Big John's scorecard. And I think Naaman was mounted on him at the time. And I was just like, oh, for fuck's sake, John. Um... But yeah, no, good performance. I really like Naaman. Um, he's sort of been flying under my radar because he was like, you know, I was hype on um, Ed Ruth as being the Dark Horse. I think I called them both Dark Horses in the tournament. I said that was like the Dark Horse matchup. But um, I've just sort of forgotten Naaman in this all this stuff that's been going on with like the disappointing MVP versus daily matchup. Uh, my boy Lima smoking uh, Koreshkov and then smoking uh, MVP. And of course, the drama with Rory saying that he doesn't want to fight anymore. But yeah, Naaman looked good. Uh, Rory advances, which gives us the Lima versus Rory matchup in the final, uh, which is pretty funny because that was the matchup already that we did uh, as, as like the best Bellator welterweights. And now you pretty much have the confirmation that they are, even though Rory was 
definitely not uh, miles ahead of either of the guys that he met on the way there this time, that is. So sticking with Bellator, you have this uh, Musashi versus Lovato Jr. card in London. Now, if you were, I, I mean, it's not often that I have to try and catch up on things by reading because, you know, I just obviously can't disappear to another room and just watch all the fights while I'm on holiday. Uh, also trying not to, but I thought, OK, I'll check what's happening. Went on um, Sherdog and uh, Bloody Elbow, and it was very hard to find coverage of this card, which was super weird because it's got their big name, uh, Musasi, against Lovato. And they put J- uh, James Gallagher on it, who they love putting uh, promotional hype behind. And Aaron Chalmers is apparently famous in the UK, though I do not know uh, what for. I think he's for that uh, from that reality TV show that's not the posh one. Uh, if you've seen me live tweet when my wife is watching Made in Chelsea, you'll know that I'm quite familiar with the characters on that. I think he's from um, Only Way is Essex or some other shit. But anyway, the timing of this event, I mean, it's just been a theme with Bellator. They just can't get this fucking timing right. And part of that is, um, you know, uh, the pl- places that they're being televised make them do weird things. But part of that is also trying to be an international fight organization, but cater specifically to America. So you've got this UK card and you've got all the fights in a weird order so that you can get your Paul Daly, Eric Silva uh, co-main event. But it's like halfway through the card because you've got to get you've got to uh, get the main event on at a time that's watchable in the US. So if you watched the main event and you were wondering why Lovato's heartfelt speech where he was crying and saying this is you, you were all sharing the happiest moment of my life uh, and, and no one was there is because the last train goes at like 11 12 out of london and everyone had fucking left because there's no other way of getting home um, so he was just there speaking to an empty arena which was tragic and then he had a post limb with oliver Inkamp, who's a very good fighter uh who they just sort of like didn't really have a place for <laughs> um but the fights i did see you know let's talk about uh james Gallagher versus Jeremiah Labiano was decent. Uh, did a good job against the black belt on the ground. Obviously, Gallagher's thing is his um, grappling. But uh, this is going to be the thing. I mean, I say it every time, but Goldie and Big John are making Bellator unwatchable. It's really hard to focus on what's going on while these guys are prattling. And if you can't hear what's happening in the cage, like the ref talking and the uh, actual connections, it's hard to... You know, you're you're trying to do everything on one sense, which is just your eyesight, um, and it's it's difficult. You know, I like being able to hear the guys stomping around when when I when you can hear them stomping in the cage, and you're like, oh, hot mic's picking up a lot tonight. Um, that's the microphone, not Mike Goldberg. He is most certainly not hot mic, but that's what I like when you can hear it all going on. Like, uh, what was the really good one? Barnett versus Nelson. You could hear every body shot slapping against Nelson's belly. Um, and the Japanese cards are especially good for that in the UFC. But I just... The fucking droning of these two morons. It's unbearable. They managed... Through the Gallagher versus Labiano fight, they were especially bad. It was just like... Talk about the fucking grappling. Stop telling me that James Gallagher trains at SBR... Uh, whatever it is. Straight Blast Jim Island. Uh, with Conor McGregor and stuff. Who was noticeably absent this weekend. Both from Bellator and from um, BKB. Paul Daly versus Eric Silver was good. Good on Eric Silva for actually weathering the storm. Uh, doesn't seem to have the, the same sort of cardio issues as badly as he was having in the UFC. Wonder why that is. Uh, but Paul Daly looked great. I thought, you know, that Eric Silva is genuinely a dangerous opponent, certainly in the first round. Paul Daly coming back from that embarrassing performance against MVP, even in his best performances, tends to not really throw in combination. Tends to just swing the left hook, occasionally spin for a back fist or whatever. This one, he's throwing low kicks, he's throwing combinations, using a left hook to set up the right uppercut, catching Silva trying to duck the left hook. Um, wheel kicked at one point, uh, came off the fence having freed his hands to do a spinning elbow. I mean, we're going to talk more about that soon because I'm probably going to do uh, Filthy Casual's Guide to John Jones. So, you know, we can talk about how he basically invented that move. Not the spinning elbow, but the uh, freeing your arms off the fence by posting your head on the opponent and then spinning into the elbow from there. Hit him with a fucking crane kick in the face, you know, the Nidan Gary, uh, knee fake to jumping front kick to the to the chin. Uh, and Eric Silva survived it all and did well off his back surviving. I mean, when we say well off his back, we're going to be talking about Rafael Lovato in a minute. And that was fucking slick what he was doing. Um, 
but I thought he did a good job. So props to Eric Silver and Paul Daly for putting on a good fight in front of Paul Daly's home crowd and making everyone forget how bad their MVP performance was. Right, let's get straight into it. That one you wanted. Uh, Lovato versus Gegard Musassi went almost identical to Musassi versus Jacare, except Jacare was actually hitting him uh, on the feet and Lovato just looked sort of timid and, and worried on the feet. However, Lovato, very interesting takedowns where Jacare's takedowns are really just dive at your leg, normally your shin, and try and put his shoulder into your knee and invert your knee, basically. Um, Rafael Lovato has some interesting takedowns. Firstly, when he shoots just a double or whatever, he uses it to come in on the uh, Lucas Lech, Damien Meyer style half guard, which is instead of the inside leg, the leg that's between your opponent's legs, hooking over the top, which is a very old school half guard. And that's how people play the knee shield, you know, because the knee shield, you have the top knee in front of the opponent, whether it's on their chest or low in a Z guard or a hip clamp. In the Lech style half guard, you have what sometimes is called a grapevine, but that's the outside leg goes over the top uh, so that you can begin applying what's called the knee crank. And the knee crank's been an interesting one in jiu-jitsu for years because technically, well, well, back in the day, people thought it was very similar to a knee reap, um, but that was sort of what got the rule uh, verified, not verified, but uh, clarified. If the opponent is in control of their movement and can turn with it, you aren't attacking their joints so much as encouraging them to move. So that knee crank is basically a signature of, of um, Lucas Leitch. And Josh Thompson brought this up during the, the uh, broadcast. And I thought, good job, Josh Thompson. He was doing decently. G- a generic in- English man who seems to p- commentate every event for every organization was there. Um, and then Big John was just talking nonsense, as always. Lucas Leitch has done amazingly against guys as big as like Buchecha uh, by using the um, that sometimes they call it a Leitch hook. Uh, he calls it like the coyote half guard, but... Uh, which is very similar to the idea of the dog fight. It's the same position when you get up to your knees. Basically, it's wrestling from the bottom, and that's what's so slick about it, uh, because you're using the underhook to peek yourself out, sneak out the back, um, and you're cranking on. The, you're coming up around the opponent's leg, which is basically bringing you in on like a deep single or uh, upper body clinch if you get up to your feet. And then you can combine that all. You know, that's the going up bit. That if the opponent like pressures back into you you can start hitting nice turnover sweeps with the knee crank and the knee crank on its own is a great position if you've watched any of paul schreiner's stuff i mean i met paul schreiner years ago uh when i visited uh marcelo's and i had no idea who he was at the time uh, and i remember thinking this guy is a really good teacher and it turns out he worked with ryan hall for years and uh ryan hall's jedi mind trick stuff the two of them worked on that together that all comes off the knee crank slash the leech hook but this this worked so well for him. It worked uh, against Salter, worked against everyone he's fought so far. Shoots in, the other guy sprawls. He shoots his legs in underneath them and drops to half guard. And then he pulls them forward and starts getting up around their leg. You've seen Damian Meyer use it to like uh, straighten out the leg and, and hit the single, uh, which is his sort of finish. But uh, Lovato will either come up on the single or, as happened against Musassi in the second or third round, Musassi got all the way up to his feet and he did what Lucas Leitch does, or Rafael Lovato did what Lucas Leitch does, which is the opponent's got that whizzer. You throw, you stand up and you throw your the leg that was hooking their half guard leg, you throw it all the way over into their hip pocket on the other side so that you've got a hook in and you start taking their back. And if you watch Lucas Leitch do this, he, you know, obviously it's a big open mat, so he can just dive and roll through onto the back. Uh, Lovato did it and Musassi smartly put himself against the fence where Lovato couldn't quite sneak around and, and uh, probably take his back. Lovato's back control in this fight was good. I mean, he lost the back uh, in one of the rounds and then ended up getting hit in the face a bit for it. And that was because Musassi was able to move around in his body triangle. Um, then switched to a body triangle which was sort of like what Ioki likes to do um, which is where you do the body triangle but instead of having your you've got the shin across the bo- the belly and, or the you know wherever the chest <laughs> in some cases if you're you know that high up but typically you don't want to be um, but you've got the, sh- the shin across the body and then you've got it hooked in behind the knee which you know the other leg goes over it hooks in behind the opponent's uh, knee or calf on the outside what the Ioki style thing is to do is to turn side on sort of so that your leg that hooks over is now instead of going over your own shin and then under the opponent's back of the knee you go over your own shin and then inside the opponent's opposite leg 
Uh, I'm not doing a great job of explaining it, but I'm going to put something up for the Patreon boys just with some uh, stills and some drawings and shit on it so that you can see what I'm talking about. Very cool, because you can, like, turn the opponent that way, and Aoki used to, like, coming up onto, like, one hand and punching the opponent with the free hand, even though he hit, like, a girl, but um, if you're a massive, muscly dude like Lovato, it probably sucks to get hit from that position. Uh, and it basically means that you can't turn into the opponent because they've got control on your... Uh, you basically got a butterfly hook in, but not quite a butterfly hook. Uh, and if you're controlling the other arm, of course, you're, you're doubly stuffed because they can't turn the other way. So that was cool. Uh, good body triangle work. Couldn't finish Misasi because finishing in gloves is very, very hard. Um, really, like, back control stuff, I think guys should be... Well, like uh, Korean Zombie did to Moikana, I think everyone should be working to get top back control, flatten the opponent on top of their hands, and just get as many free shots in as possible. Either that or you want to be tra trapping an arm because there's if they've got both hands free to grab at your gloves, they're gonna. it doesn't matter if the ref calls them for grabbing inside the glove or whatever. They've still stopped you from getting that choke then, you know? What else was cool? Oh, Levato's guard work, I said we'd talk about. Actually, no, we're talking takedowns at the moment. So he hit that knee pick that Frankie Edgar does and Frankie Edgar does it really nicely setting it up by... Um, he'll go jab, jab to the body, jab, jab to the body and then he'll go in like he's going to jab the body and instead he'll shoot his jab out but up towards the opponent's shoulder and slam him in the shoulder with his um, palm or even in the neck actually and as he goes he'll have his right hand out in behind their knee and he'll run forward pushing them so that their weight comes off that lead leg and he'll pick it up and he's done this to guys like BJ Penn back when BJ Penn was untakedownable. I think he did it to Maynard, um, did it to Jeremy Stevens who was huge compared to him, did it to Uriah Hall, not Uriah fucking Hill that'd be impressive, did it to Uriah Faber. Um, it's a very cool takedown, and only really Frankie Edgar does it. And someone on, on um, the Reddit RM, uh, Reddit MMA, uh, which I, the thread that I was tagged in like a dozen times, because people were like, Jack's going to love this. But um, someone there was saying that they trained with uh, Lovato for this fight, and he was hitting this takedown on them constantly in training. It's a very nice little knee pick. Um, obviously, I think it would work a lot better if Lovato wasn't so uncomfortable on the feet. Uh, I've seen him more comfortable than this, but again, comfort is to do with the level of the opponent. It you got to be able to, to really succeed at wrestling against or grappling generally against the best of the best. You've got to be comfortable on the feet, even when you're losing on the feet. You've got to make them think you've got to respect me on the feet, even if I'm getting hit two times for every one time I hit you. Yeah, just really nice takedowns all around. And then his guard work was great when he uh, came off, got hit, got cut by like the first elbow that Musazi landed. And Musazi was landing well from the top, even though uh, Lovato was... was uh, trying to work effectively but what he was doing was um this, these guys Wolfinghouse uh, I can't remember where they are they're somewhere Scandinavian but uh Espen and Tommy and uh, they're very they're very very high level gi competitors uh in jiu-jitsu and I think it's Espen who's good at this position but he calls it the matrix but you're seeing it a lot like Bucecha does it uh Keenan does it especially with like the gi and the, uh, the uh, meows do it but it's basically like turning over for a knee bar but you're throwing the outs. You you're turning over. You're throwing the outside leg in, and you're basically kind of like a calf slicer position. But you're just turning their knee down, and you can start attacking their back. That position uh, sort of links in with like the closed guard. Ver you know, if guys are on their knees, it's very hard to calf slice them. But you can start turning over and attacking the legs. There's some interesting uh, ways that the guys do it. Like uh, Neil Melanson's got an interesting like heel hook attack that he does from there. A great example of this is uh, Tex Johnson. I was about to say Tex Cobb, the boxer. No, Tex Johnson. Um, he, if you remember, we talked about him a little while ago. He uh, tore Felipe Pena's knee apart uh, from the 50-50. was like a surprise standout in this uh, Kasai tournament, Nogi grappling. Then got accused of rape, I think it was, and then disappeared into rehab, and we haven't really heard much of him since. But it was very impressive what he did in, the, uh, in that tournament. But if you watch his matches he has like a few go-to moves that he just does really well and one of them in fact he fought in Bellator back in the day um submitted Logan thingy whoever it was the guy who uh Paul Daly needed in the face but what he'll do is when the opponent's on their knees in closed guard he'll underhook one of their knees go both hands on it or he'll push off their face or uh, you know uh, cross underhook style frame with his other arm or whatever but he normally go both hands on and then he'll uh Basically, it's like using a knee shield to make some space, and then you invert your near knee so that it goes inside of their thigh, and then you can start turning over on the leg. And he does a great thing where he like pendulums and swings the opponent forwards. 
uh, just by having his bottom knee inside their thigh uh, and then swinging his top leg, he'll pull them out of position. Um, so Levada was going for that. If you, <laughs> My explanation wasn't great. Again, I'll write something, put some stuff up. But if you watch uh, the guard work he's doing from bottom, he underhooks the leg and he gets his knee in front of uh, Musasi's chest and then he starts using his other knee inside of Musasi's knee and he starts trying to turn over on the leg. And when, when Musasi's trying to stop him, Lovato reverses his hips, comes back the other way and snaps on a triangle or at least uh, threatens a triangle. You know, one hand is just sort of... Hand in the taint area. We were talking about this last week, but it very close to getting that full triangle position, which was pretty cool, but Musasi postured, kept it all safe, did well. Um, but yeah, he used that position several times. That uh, You'd call it like a, an attack on a knee bar or a fake knee bar or whatever, but um, like I said, Espen calls it a matrix position. Uh, I just call it going for the calf slicer or, or using that calf slicer to sweep. Um, seeing more and more guys do that from even on the knees, trying to get in front of the opponent with their knees in, in their chest and inside their uh, thigh and elevate them a little bit to attack that leg. Now, Musasi striking looked like Musasi striking always does, uh, led by the jab. Interesting use of a lead leg um, kick to the body. Quite an interesting one to use, especially if you've, you know, if the guy's already been picking up your lead leg um, in those knee picks. Landed good uppercuts because Lovato was flinching and ducking a lot. Um, Lovato's striking did not look good at all in this fight. Uh, he did. He got uh, Musashi to the fence, freed his arms, and spun for the widest elbow you've ever seen. Um, and it like, hits him with like the back of his shoulder. Um, it's interesting because like he's been a phenom in uh, grappling his entire life. You know, you were hearing stories about him just going into the gym as a child and murdering competitive adults, but he's very uncoordinated on the feet. You know, it kind of puts a whole. It, Joe Rogan always says like, if you've got world class in one uh, aspect of fighting, you can pick up the others. And in some regards, that's true. Like when we say Yoel Romero and Daniel Cormier. They apply feints and uh, mess with their opponent's expectation really well, and that's really closely linked with what they'd be doing in wrestling. Um, but you can also like be a um, uh, well, I suppose, a shark in the ocean of the ground, and then you get out on the dry land in the striking, and you just look dreadful. Um, but you know, he hearted it out. He did well on the feet, and Musasi never been the biggest hitter, and never been the best at. Um, pouring it on for a finish you know what he does is he establishes his jab and that's very much uh the best weapon if you're winning already it's not a great weapon for turning out the lights and coming from behind or, or pulling out a finish when you just really need it now i'm not gonna gloat actually because the whole thing is like musashi's not at all a bad fighter he's a very good fighter i rate him in the top 10 of the middleweights worldwide but people were so keen to pretend that he was the you know uh as good as the top guys in the UFC when he hadn't fought any of them. His best, he broke the top five once by beating Chris Weidman, who's very much hit and miss nowadays, and more miss than hit. You know, he does well in the first round and then just goes downhill. And that's exactly what happened against Musassi, happened against Jack Ray, happened against Gas. Well, no, Gaslip, he did win that fight, which was surprising. But, you know, you haven't seen Musassi against the um, Whitakers, Romero. No one's fighting Yo Romero. That's why we're talking about uh, Whitaker, why he's, why he's like he's the best. Now, I'm not saying that the fight between uh, the matchup between Musassi and Whitaker isn't interesting, because Musassi is a very slick boxer and he copes very well with kickboxers. Um, and Robert Whitaker is not uh, normally an offensive wrestler. He is a guy who can uh, counter grapple the very best grapplers in the world. Musasi is not. He's had a lot of trouble when guys just smother him with grappling. That was, the, you know, people were saying after this fight, when have you ever seen anyone slice through Gegard Musasi's guard like butter like that? And I was going, did you watch the Weidman fight? Because Weidman got tired, but he passed Gegard Musasi's guard like four or five times in the first round. And then, you know, not exactly identical, but very, very similar performance from Jacare. Jacare has learned to strike a bit more since then. You know, I we complained that he's kind of um, peaked too early in that he hasn't really learned much more, but now he's digging body shots a lot more effectively. But Jacare versus Gagard Musasi. Jacare was just walking forward, swinging bombs. Musasi was throwing his jab, but getting hit by bombs or taken down. And uh, when he got taken down, he couldn't do anything. He got to his guard and then Jacare would pass it mash him a little bit, let him get back to guard, and then pass it again. You saw Musasi go to the fence and try to use it to sit up and then stand several times in this fight, and that's where um, Jacare caught him with the guillotine. 
Lovato tried to do exactly the same thing, obviously aware of that, and Gigabi Sassi would just go back to on the ground. He'd like lay down on his side and try and make a guard again. The truth about Misasi is that like when you see people saying that he's been uh, top 20 pound for pound for like the last 10 years or whatever, what they mean to say is that he's very skilled all around. If I were picking like one of those guys that you want to show to your young MMA fighters, it'd be guys like him and Frankie Edgar, very clever, skilled all around guys. Problem is that he does lose when he fights the best of the best. Do I think he could beat Whitaker? Don't know. I haven't seen Whitaker against Whitaker against too many like stri- uh, very good strikers lately. You know, I mean, Yo Romero is a very good striker in his own right, but Yo Romero is a ten strike round fighter. Where Gegard Mousasi, when he's on, is like a, a ten jab a minute fighter. Do I think Gegard Mousasi could beat Yo Romero? Fuck no. Do I think Gegard Mousasi could beat Yo Romero because Yo Romero would take him down and maul him. I don't even know how Musasi would do against, like, Rockhold, or, um, well, Adesanya is an interesting one. And we miss out on all of that, because he's gone to Bellator. And then people were like, well, he's done his best work since leaving. And you're like, because he's not fighting very good guys anymore. Uh, Cavalio is not, he's leagues behind the top middleweights in the UFC. I just can't wait for Lyoto Machida to stall the Vato out in clinches at 50 years old, and uh, win the Bellator title again. That would be terrible. But, oh, we did see Chael versus uh, Machida. Oh my god, we're supposed to talk about Chael Sonnen's retirement, and I'm supposed to either take a side whether he's a massive ju- drug cheat or an important part of the sport. I don't really care. But um, he, his last run was all right, you know. He was never as great as people wanted to pretend he was. The the silver performances were very... Well, no, the first one was remarkable. Got gypped in the second silver performance because silver was just allowed, like, free reign to cheat as much as he wanted. He was holding... Chael up by the front of his shorts. Um, just insane how much Silver was allowed to cheat in that second fight. But, you know, Sonnen has also been caught for cheating drug-wise many, many times. However, so is Silver since then. So, you know, an important guy. And, you know, part of why trash talking is such a huge part of MMA now. But, you know, when he did it, it was always likable. Or unless you were like a real can't stay, take a step back and evaluate sort of Anderson Silver fan. Um, all Vandalay Silver fan. I mean, it was always hilarious, the Vandalay Silver stuff, because everyone else seemed to get that it's just an act and Chael's going to needle you regardless. And Vandalay Silver didn't seem to understand what this man was doing and why he was doing it. He was like, well, I have a blood feud with this man. <laughs> but yeah, couldn't uh, Chael couldn't do anything against Machida, couldn't take him down. Machida hits him with a flying knee, hit him two flying knees, got caught the same way twice. Didn't really see much else interesting out of Machida, uh, just that he stops a takedown very well, or in the conventional fighting of the takedown sense rather than the footwork stuff. I mean, he did get caught against the fence several times, but if you can stop the takedowns, why not? Man, I'm like 40 minutes in and I haven't talked about the UFC fights yet. Um, there was some okay stuff on this card. Watched the Andrea Lee fight, fair enough. We all like her now, even though she was married to a, a Nazi, knowing that he was a Nazi. Oh, Luis Pena versus Matt Wyman. This one was a little bit sad, actually. I thought Pena looked great. I, I've got a sort of investment in Pena because, and Darren Wynn, actually, because I watched the uh, I Am The Bay stuff, and they all seemed like good fun in that. Um, fascinating life story. I actually didn't mind them chiming in with his life story during this fight. I was like, wow, that's weird. I didn't know any of that. But Matt Wyman obviously been off for like six years, and he came out and his striking, he looked like Ranger Stott had just got in shape. Um, it was really... I don't want to say herky-jerky. It was just really ineffective. Um, but he was really interesting from the bottom. He was uh, hitting leg entanglements, take, uh, moving Pena around. Got to 50-50 a couple of times, but didn't really uh, break Pena's balance at all. Uh, if you watch someone really good like... Um, well, Craig Joseph doesn't use 50-50 too much, but he does... Um, but he has used it effectively in the past. I mean, well, Tex Johnson I mentioned already. Very good 50-50 user. Ryan Hall, good 50-50 user. But they're never... Like, if they're on the bottom of 50-50, they're never on the bottom of 50-50. They'll always be able to tip the opponent back into that 50-50 position. Whereas Wyman was getting the 50-50 position and then sort of letting Pena just sit on top of him, hitting him, which was... Um, I mean, he was probably tired, and uh, there's got to be a good degree of nerves coming back after six years or whatever it is. But Pena looked solid, uh, got the stoppage, and uh, we all felt a bit sadder for Matt Wyman. Not really the sort of fight he should have been coming back to. you got to feel... You know, but then you never know how these guys are going to look coming back. So, yeah. Rosenstruck versus Crowder was basically the UFC heavyweight division in a nutshell. Crowder comes out, lunges face first onto a punch, slips on a banana skin, falls down. Um, 
Darren Wynn versus Eric Spicely was good fun. I think that what you really saw there was Spicely leveraging the height advantage well. Obviously, his jab was not good. Um, because if you stand tall and you jab down at someone, you are giving them the overhand if they slip to the inside. That cross counter is just going to be there all night. And Wynn was hitting it and clubbing him with the forearm and turning him around into the left hook. There was some nice stuff from Wynn where if they got into like a little sort of semi-clinch, he'd step round to the left side and then throw in the left hook. That's a, well, a Tyson favourite, but it's also every good in-fighter ever favourite. I can, well, I was saying, I tweeted while I was watching the first round of this, uh, Darren Wynn will be compared to, will be called a middleweight MMA Tyson within six months. And then uh, Bisping says it on commentary. Bisping on commentary, I like him a lot, but he's just not, He's not enough to hold up Brendan Fitzgerald. It's just not a great booth. Uh, I don't like it very much at all. Um, but yeah, when, when they got to the clinches, Spicely used the double collar tie, which is a good way to keep guys out away from you if they want to get a body lock, especially if they're shorter. But doubly, if they're shorter, you, you can bring up that knee very, very easy because you can throw your hips back miles behind you. Um, and Wynn got hit with several of those throughout all three rounds and every time it seemed to really rattle his brain because he stepped back and just didn't fight the same way and then he'd get his confidence back and go in again um if spicely weren't a short notice replacement for bruno whoever it was who tested positive for something or other um he would probably have been able to uh, utilize that better and, and his conditioning might have let him uh, be a little bit more aggressive chasing after uh, double collar ties and things like that i mean a solid win for win but uh, especially under not ideal circumstances of having an opponent switch up. But that is a big opening there. You know, that is one way where his height is really going to uh, make him struggle, especially if he wants to stand and bang with people. Actually, got some interesting, I've got an interesting question about heights uh, that I'll read in a minute. Randy Brown versus Ryan Barbarena. I'm sorry, Brian Barbarena. I thought this was... I mean, some people were just calling this a war, but I didn't. it didn't seem like a war. Brian Barbarena just seemed to... Um, be a step behind all the time. Brown was good, used some nice front kicks to the body, looked long, strong, and incredibly durable. Um, <laughs> well, no, incredibly absorbent, isn't it? But he uh, did well, and then uh, really started piling on the body work towards the end, and it, you show, it showed that it took a toll. I mean, Brian Barberena, the stoppage that he suffered against Vincente Luke was basically down to fatigue, you know, that last second stoppage. I mean, he got punched in the head, but he was tired. Um, Get to the body on people with, with chins like Barbarena because he will take a lot of punishment to the head. And then Chanson Jun versus um, Renato Mokano. Mokano, one of my boys, on a bit of a slump now. I mean, that's that division. You lose to Jose Aldo, uh, prospect killer, and then you take a fight against another uh, top 10 guy and you just, it can happen. But Korean Zombie, I, I love him. He's fantastic. His story is so interesting because he was garbage back in the day. His whole thing was like, I will take the blows on my head and I will swing back. Uh, but really has developed over the years. And I was remember writing about this for, I think it was Fightland, before his fight with Bermudez, whenever he came back from military service. But it was like, I think he's improved a lot, but we don't have a lot of, there's not a large body of work to, to see. You know, there's the fights with Garcia where he really sharpened up a lot. Uh, he smoked Mark Hominick in a very short amount of time. Was a little bit overmatched against Eldo, but still hung in there. Um, and then got injured for the stoppage. But really, he didn't have an awful lot to show you whether he was improving or just sort of... Well, I don't want to say getting lucky, but if the, the, the cards had just fallen where he needed them to. Um, and recently, I think he's really shown that he's not just like a gimmicky take the punches and have a wild brawl fighter. He's weird... But he's got some really nicely timed counters. You know, that he does like a straight arm left hook that he lands all the time. And that cross counter that he scored against uh, Moicano in this one was perfect. And he does it a lot uh, and just smoked him. Well, finished him on the ground. But, you know, uh, that, that punch was basically, yep, you've, you're done fucked up now, Moicano. Uh, I think Moicano, you know, he, he was stepping in and got timed perfectly with this. But I think... You know, he's got a build and he's got a good jab. But he doesn't have a very intelligent jab. I think if you worked with fainting and stuff like that and if you treat if you you have to respect counter punches like that you know you can't just throw the jab and expect to hit him with a full flush jab every time you've got to be throwing out feints flicking it out there i mean flicking the jab actually that brings us on to um i don't think there's a lot more to say about that it was a perfect counter and uh what kind of got smoked before he even got into it but if we're talking about flicking the jab it's worth talking about paulie Malinaji from the weekend 
Uh, firstly, didn't think he lost this one, but I suspect that uh, BKB's brand relies on Artem's meme appeal more than it relies on Paulie Malinacci. Um, but Paulie Malinacci came out and he just skewered Artem in the face for three rounds. But then, I mean, I called it beforehand. I said, the only things I'm ever going to predict are that he's going to break his hand very early and that he's going to, um, that there's going to be some kind of pay dispute. Uh, and he did, almost immediately came out afterwards and was like, I broke my hand in the second round or whatever. And I think it was the second round where he threw a right hand to the chin and like made Artem spit everywhere. And I went, wow, okay, didn't expect that. Firstly, dangerous in bare knuckle to be hitting people in the face hard uh, with your right hand um, or your power hand or whatever. But secondly, like Paulie was never a puncher. Paulie, people were like saying after this, well, it was close and maybe Artem didn't win, but because it was close, that's a loss for Paulie. <laughs> it's like, you know, he said he's going to kick his ass. And I was going, no one should have ever believed that because Paulie Malinacci's never kicked anyone's ass. Paulie Malinacci is the kind of boxer like, oh, there was a guy that um, Duran fought back in the day. There was like three brothers, and I think he fought two of them or all three of them. But one of them danced around him and said, I can't break eggs with my punches, but I'm still beating you. <laughs> Like, just walked around him, jabbed, moved, stayed away from um, Duran's power and annoyed him. Uh, and that's the kind of fighter that Paulie Malinaji was. But he did well here. You know, he was jabbing and then he'd uh, duck in and turn. And beautiful pivots in this fight, turning around um, Artem. Tie-ups were good. Referee in this fight was much uh, stricter than in the, um, well, in most bare knuckle fights you'll see. Uh, a lot of, uh, if you see like the boxer versus MMA guy in the bare knuckle, it's normally grab a hold and start swinging uppercuts because that's a completely different game to actual boxing. Um, and Chris Lieben's fight was like that. It was just, I'm going to drive in behind the top of my head, smash it into his face, and then I'm going to hold on to him and hit. And the referee got tired of stopping him, so he <laughs> just let him do it. Um, but, you know, one of the things about gloves, uh, you know, if you watch Muhammad Ali's jab, he never really closed his fist when he jabbed. He ba basically flicked people with the back of his hand. Um, and because he was wearing big gloves, they, he used to say it was snake licking, like a snake tongue. And if you hear, um, if you watch, I can't remember which, well, most of his fights actually, but Drew Bundini Brown is always sh like shouting, snake lick him, champ, snake lick him. But you can't do that with no gloves, obviously. You've got to actually ball up your fist and try and land good punches without hurting your fingers. I mean, they had wrapped hands, which is always kind of a bummer for me with bare knuckle. But the main thing I hate about bare knuckle is the two minute rounds. The least you could do is make it three minute rounds and have more the, more of them than five or six or whatever it is. The best case scenario is that you go back to knockdowns, denote the end of rounds, and then you have as many rounds as it takes for the other guy to not be able to fight. Unfortunately, I don't think anyone's going to let you do that. <laughs> that might actually get the law involved, whereas they're at the moment sort of like, well, we allow MMA, so we'll allow this. Though they do sp seem to be taking things from the classical bare knuckle days. They make a big deal of towing the line and coming up to scratch. Um, but, it, you know, it ultimately means nothing that they've painted two lines on the floor and they have the fight to start from there. Artem Lobov basically, well, someone wrote this to me on Twitter, but basically Leonard Garcia had his way to a win here. You know, I think that's the, why Leonard Garcia is going to be a good fit in this sport. These are, this sport is for people who like swigging wide and largely not effective aggression. Um, but yeah, it was garbage. The event was garbage. Uh, Lehman versus Cochrane was garbage. Um, and unless something has changed and they they all, don't all go out of business, Bare Knuckle is going to be a garbage fad. Or just a way for, you know, MMA fighters who aren't great anymore to get some money. Oh, I've got a load of questions here, but I'm actually way over time on what I thought I was doing. And my tea's gone cold and it's disgusting. So what I'm going to do is I'll bring those questions back on Thursday and I'll answer them then. We had some stuff about weight classes and height classes and all sorts. Um, but it's good to be back, and there's a lot, to, you know, I've got to, it never fucking stops, this <laughs> this game, you just got to keep catching up now, uh, I'm going to be, like, catching up into next week, I imagine, but I've got some more fights to watch, which is good fun, um, and I'm feeling very motivated, and, like I said, lots of stuff coming for the Patreon boys, so, if you want to support the podcast and get in on the uh, Patreon articles and uh, extra things we do for the Patreon boys, because we love them, uh, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, and I will actually answer it, fightsgonebypodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time for any site, it's all on fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack, and I will catch you on probably Thursday. Oh, and I didn't even mention fucking Stamp Fair Tex uh, winning a controversial decision. If you want to see why the Giorgio Petrosian overturning is bullshit, check out how Stamp Fair Tex won her 
kickboxing title in one. Um, anyway, Chattery Blairs. <laughs> 